Thank you, Charlotte, and welcome, everybody. I will now shortly introduce you um, what th who ThoughtWorks is, uh, what status quo is about, who I am, and who will speak today. So I am Mike. I'm from Cologne and a senior consultant at ThoughtWorks. I joined in ThoughtWorks in 2019. And since then, I also worked with the DNI Council in Germany. I'm also a founding member of QueerWorks, which is an affinity group for LGBTQIA related topics for ThoughtWorks Germany. With QueerWorks, we want to help ThoughtWorks on the journey to become a champion in LGBTQIA so everybody can be and who uh, be and work as who they are in a safe environment and a welcoming community. For those who don't know ThoughtWorks, ThoughtWorks is a global consultancy working for and with customers worldwide to create custom software solutions. We currently have around 7,000 employees globally. People at ThoughtWorks are very passionate. Uh, people at ThoughtWorks are very passionate about diversity and inclusion, and we are a very diverse crowd. We constantly want to learn and grow our understanding within the DNI space and want to share our learnings and what we discover on our journey with each other, our clients, and everyone interested. This is why we have the status quo series. Today, my amazing colleague Masha will present you this, our sixth status quo, which is about empowering diversity and inclusion at the workplace. Masha is from Moscow, Moscow Russia, and moved to the UK in 2011. Masha joined ThoughtWorks in 2019 as consultant developer and is also an active member of the Intervened, which is a combined DNI affinity group in the UK and is passionate, passionate about, and, oh my God, sorry and passionately contributes to other initiatives around the DNI space in the UK. So welcome again and have fun with today's status quo. And now I'm giving it to Masha. Thank you very much, Mike, for this very kind introduction. That's, that was definitely too much. Uh, so let me share my screen so we can start. Uh, can people see it? Yes, wonderful. Uh, so I can see a lot of familiar faces. Welcome everyone who I know and even more unfamiliar faces. I want to thank uh, ThoughtWorks Germany for having me uh, today as part of this amazing series. And I highly recommend uh, everyone to check out what they did previously as well as join the next, uh, next one, number seven. And before I start, I would like to suggest to everyone to add pronouns to your names especially if you want to ask questions later. So to do that, you click on participants, which would be on the bottom of your screen, uh, find your name in the list and uh, press rename. Uh, this will take 20 seconds max, but will massively simplify Mike's life later and take away any guesswork when uh, he will ask questions. Uh, so today we're going to talk about inclusive language in workplaces. And before we start talking about the language itself, uh, let's look at the important trends that happened, that's been happening in the industry over the last couple of decades, actually before that. And that is the move from teamwork to collaboration. And what's the difference? And for some people, I would assume this uh, sounds very similar, but actually there are quite a few difference between these two models. So both teamwork and collaboration tries to achieve the same goal, is to get the job done. Uh, and it's groups of people working together, trying to get the job done. So, but the difference is that when we talk about teamwork, uh, it's basically a collection of individual efforts that are used to achieve the common goal. Uh, and the success of these teams will highly depend on how they're organized by their leader or manager or someone who leads them uh, towards, towards their goal. So on the picture on the left, you can uh, see that woman with a flag. She is the one who is under the most pressure. Uh, she will be responsible uh, and it will be down to her uh, to, the success will depend highly on what she does. However, collaboration uh, doesn't, pure collaboration, won't have a leader of some sort because uh, it will depend much more on the ability of individuals to be flexible and to trust each other uh, and uh, 
their soft skills and their ability to negotiate, uh, sorry, uh, their ability to negotiate uh, between each other to achieve the same goal. Even though the end result might be the same, it's slightly different uh, in how they do it. And the, you see it in a lot of industries, and you can probably also notice the, how much more emphasis uh, recruiters put on soft skills nowadays, and that pretty much in every interview that you do these days, especially to corporate or tech companies, there will be a cultural interview that will assess exactly those skills. Uh, also, important thing to say that uh, nowhere, or at least I, maybe I'm not aware of those, but uh, there's always a balance between the two. So uh, in uh, tech companies, which uh, tend to be more collaborative, you still will have some sort of uh, leader overlooking uh, some parts of their work. So talking about, oops, talking about collaboration in tech, uh, Tech industry, as I said already, and Thorwar has been part of that, embraced the collaboration style of the work. And the main and prime example of that work style is Agile Framework. So a quick overview for those who have never heard about Agile. Um, These 17 individuals you see on the left came together in 2001 at the ski resort for some reason. Uh, and they were trying to find a way to deliver the software quicker and more efficiently to the market. Uh, if you think about the changes that happened in the last 20 years, roughly, in the tech industry, you, you, you would imagine, you, you can imagine how much it grew over the time and uh, how much it also changed. And uh, uh, Agile is responsible for a lot of that. So these 17 individuals came together at the ski resorts and uh, after uh, lots of conversations, we, they came up with what is known today as Manifesto for Agile Software Development. And this was based on four values. And these four values are individuals and interactions over processes and tools, working software over comprehensive documentation, customer collaboration over contract negotiation, responding to change or following the plan. I'm not gonna go into detail what exactly every one of them means because this is not the main topic of today. Uh, however, I'm just gonna go draw your attention to the fact that the things that are on the left, on the right hand side, so individuals, interactions, working software, customer collaboration, responding to change, they take the priority over the things on the right. It doesn't mean that the things on the right uh, not important is when you plan your work, uh, you aim to uh, focus more or prioritize more things on the left. For example, uh, if your aim is to create an app, you want to have a working software rather than uh, start by writing in a comprehensive documentation because working software for the, your customer would be more important than the documentation around them. doesn't mean that your app shouldn't have the comprehensive documentation. It's just your focus should be on working software. And over the years, this framework gained massive interest, right? Uh, it uh, has def well-defined methodologies and approaches now. There are consultants and consultancies out there coming to the clients and helping them to become more agile. ThoughtWorks, as part of what we do, also does that quite a lot. Uh, so we come and introduce different, uh, different things that you can do in your team uh, to become more agile. And in fact, uh, the organization called CollabNet, which uh, looks uh, over the trends of uh, agile in tech industry, estimated that 97% uh, of tech companies use agile in some way or another. And uh, another important thing that happens because of agile, and we see that more and more in the industry, is the move from functional teams to what is called cross-functional teams. So on the left-hand side, uh, there are three teams of uh, there are three teams: engineers, testers, designers. Uh, they all do their own work um, separately from each other, probably sitting in different rooms or separated in some way. Uh, well, on the right hand side, we have uh, examples of cross-functional teams, uh, where the roles from the left have been mixed depending on uh, the 
requirements for every given, in my case, product. So for example, product two has three designers compared to products one and three because, and this is not based on any real team because uh, product two needs more input from the designers. However, there is one problem with that. Uh, not necessarily a problem, but it's very important to understand that collaboration doesn't automatically lead to inclusion. And uh, even though collaborative environment uh, improves the, uh, increases the diversity of thought because you normally just have uh, people who are coming from different work backgrounds who uh, work in a very different roles trying to solve the same problem together. Uh, even though you have a diversity of thought, that doesn't necessarily mean that every person there will feel included. So let's go back to the slide. So every pentagon, right, the shape with five ends, uh, represents uh, a person's role. However, it does not represent the person itself. It doesn't say anything about their backgrounds. It doesn't say anything about their identity. And even if the hiring team uh, who hired all these people or the hiring team behind this slide did a good job of hiring a diverse workforce, and in my opinion, they have, uh, it still doesn't not necessarily mean that everyone will feel included and everyone will have that sense of belonging and everyone will be heard. Even if their manager organizes the work in a purely collaborative way, even if the uh, recruitment team recruits a very diverse, a very diverse workforce. Because diversity doesn't mean inclusion by definition. And there are two different things and sometimes people confuse the two. Uh, so I thought it was worth just going over definitions. So I went to Merriam-Webster website, which I highly recommend, uh, which is a well-established dictionary uh, that I use every time I have, I find the words that I don't know in English and you can probably, as you guessed, my first language is not English. So I use it quite a lot and I use it for this talk as well. So here we have two definitions of inclusion and diversity. And inclusion is the act of practice of including and accommodating uh, people, uh, who have historically been excluded <coughs> as because of their race, gender, sexuality, or ability. While diversity is the condition of having or being composed of different elements. And the other way to say it is variety, especially the inclusion of people of different races, cultures, etc., in a group of organization. If we put it simply, diversity is what we're doing, while inclusion is how we're doing, how we're doing it. So where do we start with this how and inclusion and in my opinion inclusion starts with language and not only because it's the topic of today uh, but also because it's the most accessible tool that is available for all of us in one way or another uh, it doesn't matter whether you're in a senior position or in a junior position, whether you manage someone or not, uh, whether you're a recruiter, whether you're a software engineer, uh, whether you're a part of diversity and inclusion uh, committee at your work or your workplace doesn't have anything like that. You can still start driving inclusion in your workspace uh, just using your language. So let's start by talking about a person, any person. And I want to introduce you to the two constructions we use when we describe a person. Uh, and they're called identity first language and person first language. Identity first language puts the identity or descriptor or the visible identity, uh, which can be literally anything. It can be nationality, it can be medical condition, it can be sexual orientation gender, anything, uh, first before the person itself. While person first language puts a person before their identity and person language describes what the person has rather than what the person is. And that already switches um, the focus by quite a lot, which I try to demonstrate by the picture here. When we talk about someone as a disabled person, first thing that uh, comes across is that fact that they're disabled. 
and we basically this way saying that this is their main uh, part of their identity without actually asking the person what their main part of identity. We just assume that this is what it is. Uh, while the person first, we, we have a person who has, uh, you know, interest, plays a guitar, wears a crown, whatever that might be. Uh, so bear that in mind. And there are many, there are a few, I put a few examples on this slide of identity first versus person first language. And unfortunately, there is no one size fits all whether we should all use identity first language or person first language describing someone, because this will massively vary across different regions. It will obviously vary across different cultures and languages. It will also depend on how, um, how the groups that we're describing see um, their identities, like is it their identities, is it something that they are, or is it something that they have? And I want you to, before you, when you start, when you describe someone um, and you use some sort of descriptor, um, I want to encourage you to think about several things. First, identify whether you're using identity first or person first language. So start with that. And also, I guess uh, it's important to point on this slide that uh, the uh, person parts of, um, for example, everything on the left hand side is identity itself, because a man, a child, a woman, a musician are all identities of some sort. So ask yourself which language I'm using and what is more important right now, and then I want you to ask yourself whether their identity actually important at all. Um, for example, uh, if you have a colleague who identifies as lesbian, uh, there is no need to refer to them all the time as my lesbian colleague. Uh, and also, and only like have that descriptor about them or just put it as the main um, debate the identity that they have because that person probably has different identities and uh, their sexual orientation is not the main one. However, uh, if you're invited by the same person, and in this example, we assume that you're straight, uh, if you're invited by this person to an LGBTQ event such as Pride and you're telling your friends about it, that will make perfect sense to tell your friends that my colleague who is a lesbian invited me to Pride because that gives uh, appropriate context. Um, now, let's move to talking to a group and about some groups. So all of us, everyone on this call, everyone who's going to uh, watch this video later, literally everyone uh, in the world has multiple identities, right? Uh, some of them are on this slide. Uh, we all have a very different makeup of those categories. Uh, and, and there won't be probably two people on this call who would match exactly the same, unless uh, they had exactly the same life and also their twins. Uh, so when you're referring to the group of people, bear in mind that everyone is different and uh, everyone might be different from you and from what you consider the norm. Uh, but here you may ask, Masha, I can't read people's minds. I'm not physically able to keep in mind all the identities, all the different like subcategories. I don't, um, I can't read people's mind and understand whether I'm offending them or not offending them. How do I know? And uh, even on this slide, you don't have all the identities present. It's just impossible to be inclusive for everyone all the time. And I would say that it does, it might be overwhelming thinking about that. So if the question, am I including everyone, is too overwhelming, in, um, in turn, ask yourself whether you include, uh, whether you excluding anyone. So is, for example, the way you currently address the group includes everyone, or does it unintentionally exclude someone from the group? Because uh, the thing about inclusion if, and diversity as well, uh, 
is usually, and I'm sure that all the people, everyone out of 54 people on this call, uh, never actually plans to um, offend someone or exclude someone. We're all trying to bring more inclusion to our works, workplaces. Like if, you, if you're not, probably you're not on this call. So when you have this intent, when you have this intent to not uh, exclude anyone, you also have to consider the impact um, of, you also have to consider the impact you are, you are making, even though your intention wasn't there in the first place. So uh, ask yourself, whether you're excluding anyone, uh, whether your well, way of uh, talking to someone is uh, inclusive enough. And to help you with that, I'm gonna give you a list of more and less inclusive words uh, that you can use. I specifically went for more and less inclusive words rather than inclusive and non-inclusive because it's all a spectrum. Everyone will have a different definition. It is, I agree, impossible to include everyone and read everyone's mind, but we can try to uh, be uh, as inclusive as we can. And I'm also going to give a content warning before the next slide. The red slide will have uh, some offensive words, some discriminatory words specifically towards mental health and race and some others. So apologies about that. So I want you to look at this slide and I want you to look at it and try to find the words that you use uh, when you describe someone when you talk about something, especially at work. And before you rush to the chat and ask why, Masha, why this word? Why is it? Why is it not inclusive? I use it all the time and nobody seems to mind. Uh, I want you to pause because there's going to be a next slide that will have a better example of that. Um, so I hope everyone had a chance to look at those because I'm moving to the next one. You can probably notice that uh, quite a few of the more inclusive words on this slide are actually longer than the previous one. So the exact places also won't much compared to the previous one. Um, and like, once again, it's not necessarily uh, acknowledges including, including, including everyone, you know, comma after comma after comma but it's a more neutral way to um, address people. And I, would, uh, I want to draw your minds to a few things. Uh, and uh, first of all, you probably noticed, especially with the previous one, there are quite a few identity first language. In fact, they're so identity first that the person bit was completely thrown away. Uh, for example, the blacks, psycho, uh, gays, alcoholic, things like that. These are not inclusive, not so inclusive terms. Um, and they take away the person part of it. And we don't want that. We want to recognize the humans behind identities. Uh, and there are quite a few words you can use instead. Uh, the next thing I want to address is the uh, greetings. And there are two on the red slide. Uh, so it's guys and ladies and gentlemen. So when you address a group of people as guys, that's completely normal. That's completely acceptable in our day and age, uh, as well as ladies and gentlemen. We don't mean to exclude people normally. We don't mean to um, exclude people who don't identify as guys. They don't identify as ladies or who don't identify as gentlemen. So there are people like that exist. We don't mean it. Uh, but it's also always been like that. I hear quite a lot of that. However, we can just put a little bit of extra effort and replace guys with everyone. And then ladies and gentlemen with, for example, honored guests. Uh, it won't be a big effort for us, usually, normally, especially if it's an email, if we're still talking about workplace. However, it will make a massive difference to the people you're talking to. And uh, especially it will make uh, people who won't identify with the previous categories feel included or specifically feel not excluded, which is what we're also aiming for. 
because we all have this idea that everyone belongs, uh, but we might be unintentionally, we might be unintentionally excluding people with some of our language. Um, other things include just more neutral definitions that uh, do not have a negative connotation and negative uh, sense in them. Uh, for example, instead of normal, you can say typical because when you say normal, and that's especially true when we talk about neurodiversity and mental health, when you say normal, you imply that everyone else is not normal and therefore bad, and that's not inclusive. And instead of normal, you can use the word typical, and typical is much more neutral word for that. And uh, you can also look in the other examples here, find them useful. And uh, I want to give you more practical tips to be more inclusive to your colleagues. It's another two colored slide. And I want to encourage everyone uh, to practice things on the left more and try to avoid things on the right. Uh, it's obvi obviously we can't be perfect in every way all the time. Uh, we all make mistakes. We're all learning all the time. Our openness to learning is actually more important here. Uh, and uh, whether and it is, I think it's like all of us should stop looking into things as like, it's human, it's normal to, to make mistakes. It's absolutely human to make mistakes. It's normal to not know things. It's not, um, it's absolutely okay to change your views, change your mind, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm gonna draw your attention to a few things on this slide. Uh, first, introduce yourself with pronouns or put them in your Zoom. If you forget doing that, this is why I have them in my Zoom. Uh, this will, there are several reasons why, would you, why you would do that. Uh, like first, the most selfish, reason would be the fact that uh, people have different names. Some of them uh, you won't expect uh, the gender be what, what, like sometimes you have no idea what gender the person is who has this name, what gender the person with that name typically would have, right? Uh, second, it's uh, for people who do not identify with the gender they were assigned at birth, it gives them a uh, an idea that this is a safe space and that they can uh, be and uh, who they are and uh, introduce themselves also with pronouns, which, for example, won't shock me personally because I understand how this whole framework works. It's an extra effort that you do to make people feel more included. And it's on, not only about people of uh, it's not only about uh, people who don't identify with gender who uh, they were assigned at birth, it's also with other communities because uh, I feel like pronouns in the bio or in the email signature or everywhere became such a sign of, uh, I don't want to say wokeness, but progressiveness, and that uh, you would assume that that person uh, will not discriminate against you because they're already not discriminating against other community. Also, understand your biases and don't assume that you don't have any because we all have biases. Some of them are conscious, some of them are not conscious. Uh, I would encourage you to constantly learn, constantly research things, uh, constantly try to understand people who are not you. Uh, for example, uh, and also as I assume nothing, don't, and also don't make anyone explain their identity to you. For example, we're in the middle of Ramadan season. Uh, don't approach your Muslim colleagues asking whether they fast, whether they don't fast, why they do that, uh, what's led them to this experience. Don't comment on, uh, don't share your views on that practice because unless they, started the conversation with you or they wanted to share it with you uh, because they don't have to explain your identity at the workplace and any given time. Um, like we're still talking about the workplaces and people of multiple identities that are different 
from yours do not all give the explanation of explaining those identities and there are a lot of um, a lot of resources available online where and there are lots of books published and uh, you can uh, research things on your own and then ask uh, when you talk to your colleagues also avoid use of jargon the use of acronyms complicated language and uh, if you are happen to have a high level of english high level of language for example english uh, it's your responsibility to align with another person and uh, to find a common ground where everyone understands each other uh, in fact that would work with every majority group like if you if you are a majority it's on you as well to drive the inclusion of those who come from underrepresented backgrounds also my favorite make sure you pronounce their name correctly uh ask and also you can so far, I haven't found a single name that you couldn't Google that won't have some sort of audio available on the first page of Google. It's all exists. Uh, and that's not only just a basic respect, but also you're showing to that person that you respect their identity. You made your research if it was needed. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's the first the first step to for them to feel included. Also ask for and give feedback when it's acceptable, uh, especially if you're in a manager position um, or in some sort of lead position, if you're a tech lead or you're a tech team, for example, ask for feedback specifically on the topic of an inclusion and ask people whether you can improve on that and what can you do. Um, don't expect everyone to give you all the answers. There might be a reason they're not like, or if everyone telling you everything is fine, that might necessarily mean that everything is fine. It might mean that they don't feel safe to talk to you about it. So try to understand why, and especially uh, when you talk to people from underrepresented backgrounds and you're not part of one. Uh, avoid microaggressions, which are, Quick, quick, uh, quick definition is uh, microaggressions are not actual big aggressions, but they're like little things that uh, people, people from, uh, I would say, different backgrounds will get quite often. So as I, my personal example would be people tell me, oh, your English is so good, but I find it quite a weird compliment personally, uh, and I don't think it's a compliment, considering that I've been living in the UK for 10 years, I uh, got an education here, I've been working in the uh, English speaking environments all the time. And uh, I kind of feel that when I'm being judged on my professional experience, the ability to use English is not one of them. Um, and also, that would be people of color get this quite often, which is, but where you're really from like yeah i get it you're from the uk but where you're really really from uh and that counts as microaggression because uh it's the question that you won't ask your white colleague it's the question that you won't ask someone like you won't compliment someone's use of english if they're a native speaker uh so watch out for that and uh be open to feedback and uh like make sure that people know that you're open for feedback and don't give unsolicited feedback. So the feedback that nobody asked for uh, on any point. But at the same time, uh, call out people for being non-inclusive in public spaces. For example, if somebody addresses the group guys, you could just say, and girls too. And so that already will be a little bit of difference. I've seen people doing that and I'm personally very grateful to them for them because I usually find myself uh, as, uh, as a woman, I usually find myself in the minority in the tech teams because this is a tech industry. Uh, so yeah, I would personally do it, but also I'm really thankful for people who do it as well, who are not women. So that always, you know, I always feel more included. And last but not least, um, a few takeaways. Uh, so if you 
completely didn't listen for the last half an hour, uh, you can look at this slide and this is basically a summary of what we talked about so far. Uh, be mindful in your communication. Think about what you say, think about how you address people, uh, sort of have a feedback session with yourself, think how you can improve. Educate yourself as much as you can, to educate yourself about uh, the issues that do not concern you directly. Uh, it can be about people around you, or it can be about uh, different cultures around uh, the world. Uh, constantly, constantly educate yourself and try to understand the other points of view and how people, like, how people find themselves where they are. Recognize your biases, constantly work on your biases, once again, we'll have them, we will continue having them, and it's okay, it makes us human. Just be mindful about them, recognize them, and try to uh, do something about them. Give a platform, amplify other voices, especially if you are coming from the overrepresented background to the underrepresented, uh, in relation to the other underrepresented background. Um, if you're a man in a tech team, uh, give women a voice, uh, ask what they think, ask oh, during the, I don't know, uh, retrospective that you have with your team in the end of the week. If you see that someone is being quiet, ask them what they think, if, if you think it's appropriate and if it's comfortable for them as well. Uh, stay open-minded, be ready to change your mind, and also seek feedback where possible, and also cultivate the sense of belonging um, and I'm going to finish with uh, the quote of, from the book that I recently read, uh, about which is called Belonging, uh, which says exactly, belonging is where everyone can tell your story, can tell their story. And I want to encourage you to help people telling their stories. Uh, and the language is the prime tool that you can use. I was also asked to provide a few resources uh, and I'm very happy to share it with you. So first is uh, Diversity Wins, How Inclusion Matters. Uh, it's the report that was published, I think it was either end of last year or beginning of this year, they published the latest version. So McKinsey and company uh, does a lot of research around diversity and inclusion, how it affects businesses, how they benefit from it, how they benefit from it financially. I found it very interesting uh, and also what works and what doesn't work. So uh, I encourage you to check it out, available online. Also the book that I just mentioned, which is Belonging, the key to transforming and maintaining diversity, inclusion and equality at work. Uh, I would specifically recommend it because it's not one of the wishy-washy overly optimistic uh, books. It takes quite a constructive looks on the trends in diversity and inclusion uh, in the latest years and uh, also discuss the things that might go wrong and might not go wrong. So check it out. It was published last year as well. So actually it talks a bit about uh, pandemic. Personally, for me, uh, the illuminated, illuminating book about the identity of blackness outside of the US was why am I no longer talking to white people about race? Uh, even though it uh, heavily focuses on the UK, I think uh, people outside of the UK will also find it quite useful. Um, I also included the blog post that I wrote last year for uh, ThoughtWorks website on the International Pronouns Day, where I go into details why should we all start adding pronouns everywhere? Uh, last is the book called What Works? Gender Equality by Design, which is also quite an applicable uh, book that uh, tells you about the quite applicable ways of how you build the uh, gender equal work environment. This, is, this was all I wanted to share with you today. Uh, provided the time constraints. And I want to pass it over to Mike because I believe there are a few questions in the chat. Thank you, Masha, for the amazing presentation. And yes, there are some questions. So let's start with the questions. The first question is from Franzi Winter. How do you ensure that all of, the, of this is incorporated in a daily business and company values? and is also continuously addressed and visible. 
for example, by including it in the onboarding process, etc. I I haven't got the first part. Oh, sorry. How do you ensure that all of this is incorporated in daily business and company values? Right. Uh, so quite often, well, the main way currently taken by quite a lot of industries, even though it's currently questionable whether it's the most efficient one, but the easiest usually available uh, is unconscious bias training. Uh, which uh, should be, in my opinion, created uh, rather than inviting someone from the outside to do it for you, to invite some fancy consultants uh, from the diversity and inclusion space, uh, like create the framework yourself, create the training yourself, ask for help, sure, but uh, address the issues that exist in your own company and relevant to your people uh, and do that all the time. Also, of course, onboarding, uh, which should include things, uh, should, inc should include as part of like your induction or uh, whatever, whatever is there. It's like just explaining people how we do things. A well-written code of conduct available everywhere. Uh, we have that at ThoughtWorks, so we not only we have a code of conduct for every event that we host, and there is uh, a link available somewhere. Uh, I think Charlotte posted it in the chat earlier at some point. Uh, so it's like you can uh, check out what's the code of conduct that we're using, uh, but also make it available and like in details explain what it means. Uh, in your internal network as well. Hope it answers the question. Thank you. Um, the next question is from Charlotte. What would you recommend to start a topic inclusive language in an already established team? Um, I, I guess it really depends on the team and what's already available to you. Uh, but I would start with just starting with yourself so be the role model in your team talk to people uh talk to people inclusively call out people so for example like once again somebody says guys say and girls too uh it's like call out people call out people for uh not being inclusive uh, but once again, it really depends on what kind of team you have and how many of those conversations you're already having. Uh, and also find allies, find people who already on your side and know exactly what, what they what they need to do. Uh, who like who are, these people would usually already be involved in diversity and inclusion initiatives uh, in your company or outside. So if you have allies or co-conspirators, even uh, use them. If you can start having it as part of the, like, depending on what kind of calls you have, if you have some sort of retrospective, I'm not sure what kind of team it is. Uh, if it's a tech agile team and you have retrospectives, right, this is the perfect place for you to start addressing that and see how people actually feel about it. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. There's a kind of related question from Susanne. What would you recommend how to react when somebody says something or uses a term that I don't consider as being inclusive? Um, feedback. <laughs> feedback to them uh, and find, uh, well, the whole magic of giving uh, feedback is the whole separate topic. Uh, but generally, find a place, find a place and time. So if it depends what kind of person that is. If they're already able to, if they're, if you know that they uh, are open to learning, open to admitting mistakes and everything, great. Like call it there and then if they already sort of used to it. If not, uh, try to have a one to one conversation with them or try to ask someone to have a conversation with them if you don't feel safe or, uh, yeah if you don't feel safe doing that but yeah talk about it with them and uh e explain to them how 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 and why it's not inclusive enough and that if we want to be truly inclusive to that this is what we probably need to do 
but it's tough. It's tough and especially tough when uh, you don't have like the overseeing diversity and inclusion, uh, someone in your company overlooking, overlooking all that. All right, thanks. There's another question from Waldemar Kindler. Is there a recommended inclusive way to ask about the cultural background of people or should we avoid discussions about such topics at all? I would say, well, like if we're talking about work situation, I would say that it's probably irrelevant where they're from. It's probably irrelevant what their cultural background is. Uh, I would say that if you're, um, if you sort of like build trust and friendship with that person, then it will be absolutely okay. And I'm sure you'll find uh, a way. Avoid things like where you're really from. Um, I would also, um, so I have personal, my personal hack in the UK, partly because uh, I never know whether the person actually has an accent and this accent is from here or is it from somewhere else because of the diversity of the accent in the UK. I usually ask them like, are you from the UK? And they would be like, yes, or no, I moved here. Uh, if they're yes from the UK and uh, they're coming from the, uh, like they're a person of color, for example, that probably there is no acceptable way of uh, asking that question is uh, how they made it to this country, why, who their parents are, and everything and everything, everything. Uh, however, wait for the opportunity for them to sell themselves. But I would necessarily, I would say that in the work environments, uh, in the neutral conversations that have something to do with work, uh, nobody actually owes me the explanation of explaining where you're coming from. Um, if they want to share it with you, they will. If they don't, too bad. All right, thank you. We have, oh, sorry. We have another question from Annika. What is your strategy to deal with defensive reactions to DNI efforts? I would like, once again, I think it's worth giving feedback when the person is ready to receive it. So time and place. So, uh, depends on how defensive they get, uh, depending on, uh, whether how, how safe you are feeling at that moment. Uh, if you can ask them, you can ask them to do it for you. And then it really will depend on what kind of like dynamics you have in the team. Um, however, uh, discriminations. Uh, in most of the European countries are very well written in the laws and uh, your HR will probably know what counts as uh, discrimination and microaggressions would count as them. And you can go to and report micro, microaggressions to your HR team. And that's if, if, if the situation leads to that, uh, what I found out, which uh, is that there are quite a few uh, laws uh, that exists to protect you if the situation becomes done. This unfortunately would be my only my only advice. But also is like keep trying to find other ways. Um, yeah. Try to find co-conspirators, trying to find people who uh, understand what you mean. Yeah, but also you can't change everyone overnight, I would say. So at the same time, it's like what I notice in quite a few spaces, for example, if everyone puts their pronouns in their in their uh, in their names, then the person who don't have the pronouns will be pretty much pressured to put something there as well. Uh, so, be a role model. Find other role models. Good luck with that person if they become defensive. All right, thank you, Masha. And I also had a question. Do you maybe have some more examples on microaggressions? Yeah. Um, I mean, I actually, instead of giving you lots of examples about microaggressions, uh, first I would recommend uh, checking out the other talk in this series by Emily Lynch, who I believe talks about it in quite detail. 
other examples of microaggressions would be another example that is quite popular, for example, uh, people of color uh, who have curly hair, quite often uh, white people come and approach them and uh, touch their hair without asking or just like saying something like, oh, your hair is like, oh, wow, they're, are they natural? Are they, can I, and, and they just like, and they just touch it. That's also a microaggression because why would, why, why, why would you do that? Uh, and there is a good explanation around that as well. Uh, yes. Uh, I would say anything that comes through assumption, from assumption, uh, for example, uh, for example, you're dating someone, right? You're, you're in a relationship with someone and it's been a few years and you talk about it to your work colleague and your work colleague is like, so when are you going to get married? Or so when are you going to have kids? That would count as a microaggression, especially if you're, uh, especially if you are not planning to marry or you're not planning to have, to have kids and it's also none of the, anyone's business. Like stop assuming it, uh, stop, stop, stop uh, waiting for them. Stop, uh, stop like sort of putting uh, your ideas on uh, other people's or like you understanding of the world. All right, thank we you. We in the relationships. Yes, Mike, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, one of those, like, and ask comments that I just, like, what, where are you coming from with this? And it's like, why do you ask this? And uh, I don't have to explain any, any of this to you, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're referring to my comment right now? Yes. Maybe if someone didn't get it, uh, I just wrote that I often got asked when I had a boyfriend who's the man in the relationship by straight people. And I, at some point, I just rolled my eyes and was like, <laughs> I'm gay. There is no, <laughs> you know. All right. Thank you. Um, and we have another question from Engine Diri. He wants to know what do you mean by jargon? Is there an example? Ah, uh, sure. So, uh, for example, consultancy, management, some very important meetings, someone says, uh, ah, yeah, sure. Uh, so agile, the one I talked about, that was full of jargon. For example, I use the word retrospective, I use the word stand up, I use the word, I can also say uh, show and tell. And uh, people in the room who understand what agile is, especially in detail, uh, would would see it's like yeah exactly i know what you mean however the person who doesn't necessarily work in the agile world uh would not know what every one of them means so retrospective is the meeting that you have uh sort of in the end of the sprint sprint is uh the chunk of time basically you spend on part of the project uh so retrospective you have those in the end of the sprint where you talk about how everything went um, stand-ups are these morning meetings every day where you just discuss everything people done the day before and they're planning to do the next day. So if I just went, right, so when we have uh, stand-ups, uh, retrospectives and uh, uh, do everything fully agile and uh, let's finish our sprints in five minutes or something like that, and you have no idea what this word means, that would be an example of that hope it makes sense. Yes, okay, thanks. <laughs> Looks like he, he got it. Now we got a comment from Sarah. I was in a DNI training the other day and it struck me then and there. Uh, sorry, it struck me that there is a real issue with fossilized language such as guys and that the older people in our session um, I'm 58, but linguistically attentive. The more defensive they became, and the more likely to say that it's. Eh, wait. The more defensive they became, the more likely to say that it's all political correctness gone mad. That's a difficult hurdle to jump, clearly, uh, but worth preventing. Yeah, I would I would agree with Sarah here. <laughs> Pers persevering, actually, not preventing. Oh, sorry, persevering. Yeah, thanks. 
Yeah, I would agree with Sarah here. It's like you have this conversation, but also, and it's like, yeah, I definitely heard that. Or PC, we don't want to come across as PC brigade uh, with this, this, and that. Uh, and uh, what I noticed over the years is that this will come. I see more and more people from the categories you described uh, being on board and starting to understand. And I would personally say that uh, if you asked me 10 years ago uh, what my pronouns are, I would be very confused and also ask, why are you asking me this? It's not important. My pronouns are she and her, that should be obvious. Like that's, a, by the way, example of microaggression, example of that everyone learns. But like I sort of picked it up from the environments probably around the university time. Um, and I know that other people do as well. It's a slow process, but I think we're all moving towards the right direction. All right. Uh, we have another comment from Sabrina. At microaggressions, something that keeps popping up are assumptions. Oh, wait, sorry, no, again. At microaggressions, something at. At microaggressions, something that keeps popping up are assumptions, comments that women or female presenting folks don't belong, etc. Et yes. Et that would be, yeah. And also, uh, sorry, um, in tech meetings or similar events, or that they're, uh, they are there to take notes or bringing coffee. Yes. Yes, that also happens quite often. And another example is, I guess, along those lines. Uh, when you have to organize a meeting, you constantly, like the first person you think is the woman in the room, like you sort of like allowing women to do uh, the, the organizing work, the sort of less important work, the, uh, yeah, it's a housework, no, I forgot the word for that. Um, and that happens, and that also would be definitely an example of microaggression. And just not asking women, in general, in tech, in the in the, in tech meetings, assuming they have nothing to say. Yes, thanks. We have another comment or question from Engine Diri. Is it okay to say hello or thanks in the language of the other person, just as a guest gesture? As I work in a diverse work field, and I say always "dobre dien" or "namaskar." I hope I pronounced it correctly. <laughs> Um, uh -huh. okay. uh, well, <laughs> I would say it depends on the person. So I really adore when people uh, make an effort and say Zdrastvite to me or Privet because I understand how much effort that takes. Uh, and uh, I, I, I appreciate that. But at the same time, I would not say for like everyone, I would say it depends on the person. Um, maybe, maybe they'll find it stupid. What definitely don't do is when you greet a, uh, someone who doesn't speak the same language to you and you know three words, don't rush to them saying all the swear words you know. This is definitely an example of something not to do. I can see Mike laughing there. <laughs> Like I, for example, know a few, 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 few swearing words in German, but so far I haven't shared my knowledge with uh, Mike Charlotte, Suzanne, etc. And um, yeah, but I get quite a lot as a Russian, and you probably can guess which two words I get the most often. All the gamers will probably know. <laughs> and don't post them in the chat. <laughs> all right, thank you, Masha. I think that's all. We had all questions asked. I would say big thanks to you and a lot of thanks for all people who ask questions and our particip participants. And I would say, I give it to Charlotte now. Thank you very much, Mike. Susanna, are you going to share or should I share? <laughs> we have some additional um, information. We have uh, once again summarized uh, the resources Masha shared with us. And we also have some next talks in the pipeline, but don't have any dates yet. So stay tuned. We will announce it on our landing page. 
And I now rushed through the slides, <laughs> the last slides of the evening. Um, so here again, the resources. Um, yeah, as we have learned from the chat, probably as well, the discussion going on that this inclusive language thing is a, an ongoing continuous learning process. And it's important to educate yourselves. And um, yeah, we are still, everybody's not perfect. So um, yeah, it's, it's important to keep an effort. Next events, I said, are in the pipeline. We don't have um, concrete dates yet. Um, stay tuned. Um, we will update the landing page as soon as we have more details. You will also find the next events on Meetup as you know it. And we're very happy to welcome you again. It was really nice to have you here tonight. And I wish you all a very pleasant evening. Um, enjoy dinner if you haven't had it already. And um, yeah, stay healthy. See you next time.